Do you have what it takes to win a cosplay craftsmanship contest? Honestly, I have no idea, but I do know that if you're interested in competing, you should totally give it a shot. All you need is the want to try, so don't let anything hold you back from doing so. But positivity not really aside, but also positivity aside. Do you have what it takes to actually try to win a contest? Because preparedness can really help. A lot. <laughs> And if you think that you're unprepared for the whole endeavor, don't go anywhere, because today for your benefit and possibly your amusement, I am going to overanalyze the shit out of cosplay craftsmanship contests. We are gonna go over what these contests are looking for in terms of judging criteria, what defines each of their categories or lack thereof, and which category you should enter into with the skills that you have. So let's jump into it. Except let's not, let's, just, let's just to be totally clear, this is not a video about what to expect when it comes to the actual experience of showing up for a cosplay competition. If you are looking for a video like that, you are actually looking for this video, maybe, which hopefully just appeared in a card somewhere on the screen, I don't know. Or maybe possibly this one, or others. I kind of have a lot of cosplay contest help content on this channel, and I even recently did a collaboration with the lovely Jess Less in this video, which you should totally check out. But if you're here for what contests want to see from you and how the heck the categories work, stick around. Or skip around. There are timestamps in the description as usual. <laughs> okay, now let's jump into it. <laughs> let's start off with a crash course on the cosplay competition categories. I might die of alliteration in this video, oh my god. <laughs> Not all contests have categories, but many do, and when they do, they often divide up contestants based on how skilled they happen to be. Often contests like this have different categories for how they define beginner, intermediate, and advanced level crafters. And while these categories can have a lot of different names and contest-specific quirks, they're also often called novice, journeyman, and master. I have a lot of experience with contests that operate like this, as an audience member, a competitor, and a judge. And you might too, or you might not. There are a lot of cosplay contests in the world and nothing is standard across all of them. And you should totally read the rules to determine how the contests you're interested in participating in work. However, it is becoming much more common to see categories based in skill mastery, like the level system of novice journeyman and master at the average cosplay contest, AKA masquerade. So. I've mentioned this little factoid in videos before, and I've also mentioned that I got this information from the International Costumers Guild. And while this category segment is a crash course, I did warn you that I would be overanalyzing everything in this video. So I'm gonna go on a quick tangent and talk about the ICG, because it dawns on me that not everyone knows what the ICG is. And you know what? I don't blame anyone who doesn't, because it's not exactly a huge and well-known organization, but it is worth talking about. So, in their own words, the ICG is an affiliation of hobbyist and professional costumers dedicated to the promotion and education of costuming, including cosplay, as an art form in all its aspects. And the key word here to me is, of course, education, because they do a lot of it. They have many different chapters in many different communities. They have libraries of reference material. They have in-person and online workshops. The list goes on. This organization may not be huge and literally world-renowned, despite technically being considered international and them, you know, calling themselves that, but that doesn't change their mission or the validity of the education that they're trying to promote. And relevant to my ongoing conversations about cosplay contests here on this channel, they have a pretty cool resource, the ICG guidelines to ensuring fair competition. Once again, in their words, because I'm not affiliated with them and I don't want to mess up their statement. The members of the International Costumers Guild have developed these guidelines to promote fairness and equity in masquerade competition and judging. The ICG guidelines are rooted in decades of our members' experience as costume participants, judges, producers, and directors of such competitions. We hope these guidelines will help make both novice and accomplished costumers' experience with masquerade competition and costuming more comfortable and enjoyable. And in the mostly unrecorded and hard to research field of cosplay contests, or maybe not professionally and well-documented would be a better choice of words, experience like this is priceless. When I do research on contests, mostly for my own personal interest, but sometimes, sometimes for the videos, a lot of what I end up finding is what people have happened to post on social media that has also happened to stand the test of time. 
Like, they've never purged the information themselves, and the site that they posted on has miraculously stayed up over various eras of internet. So I find a lot of stuff like old Facebook and Tumblr posts, as well as sometimes some old sus video documentation and vlogs which is usually incomplete footage of or about contests on YouTube. And this is both a gold mine of primary resources and a hot f***ing mess because <laughs> it is really hard to take all this information and condense it into palatable summarized research. But that's exactly what the ICG has done. They have looked at contests and contest trends for years and years and created documents based on them and how they'd recommend keeping these contests as fair as possible. Their first guideline document came out on May 4th, 1992, and their latest amended document came out on April 25th, 2021. Their organization may not be the most prestigious, but their work is expansive and it is the answer to the research I've been doing, as well as the answers to a lot of questions that cosplayers have about how the heck cosplay competitions work. This is why I've taken stock in their guidelines. To an extent, please always read your specific contest rules. And why, at least at the time of recording this video, I'm encouraging others to do so. The ICG guidelines are a really cool resource. Except if you don't want to take these decades of experience at face value, you don't have to. <laughs> Here's a little tangent for the tangent as a treat. <laughs> if you want to fact check the ICG's current document and also waste a f***ing ton of time because you're procrastinating on your anime Boston cosplay, <laughs> for example, not related to anyone filming this video, I would highly encourage you to look through the information that is readily available to research because it's current at fancons.com slash look at the sample group and research that I've put together in an obscenely large Google sheet. <laughs> it may not be able to point you in the direction of all the contest trends that have come and gone, but fancons.com literally just lists a ton of different conventions and links their official updated websites, and you can... Well, I was gonna say quickly find, but uh... It's not quick, but you can find the current most popular method for creating divisions and contests. And if you do so, you're gonna find out that the ICG is on the money. But you don't even really have to put in all that work if you don't wanna. <laughs> I haven't gone through the entire thing yet, and that's like technically why I'm encouraging you to do your own research, because there is still some research to be done. Although I, I do intend to finish that research eventually. But at the time of filming this video, I have sampled over 500 events from the list of 2023 worldwide fan cons. And the results of my research have been blowing my mind. <laughs> to start off, out of the 500 plus events that I looked at, only 221 made any mention of having a cosplay craftsmanship contest or craftsmanship portions of multifaceted contests on their website. Learning this was hilariously earth-shattering for me. <laughs> like, first of all, I just I just want to I just want to whap this information via cardboard tube on cosplayers' heads every time I see weird inflated contest ego or obsession. <laughs> because holy sh**, cosplay, especially cosplay contests, are such a small niche among pop culture niches. And by cosplayers, I mean me. <laughs> This might be my whole world and I like to talk about it and I think it's cool and I hope to help some people with it, but holy shit, it is so tiny. Uh, but second of all, and this is gonna be a total downer, but it's worth bringing up. The amount of cons that advertise themselves with images of cosplayers, but don't even bother to make cosplay events is just ridiculous. Like, in a way it puts into perspective how valuable cosplay is to cons like this, but how little higher-ups even respect cosplayers as paying attendees, let alone members of the greater geek community. I don't know, it's not really related to this video, but something to think about and possibly demand they be better about, but moving on. Out of the 221 events that had craftsmanship and related contests according to the information available on their websites, 83 of those just don't elaborate further. So as much as I encourage people to read the rules, like, if that doesn't prove how necessary hopefully this video is, but also any and all informational resources that help to prepare for contests like this, I don't know what does. 
out of the tragically few 138 out of the original 513 conventions left that had contests and information available on them. The best system was hands down Megacon Live Dublin's uh, Bard, Adventurer, and Artificer categories. The fun names hide it, but essentially the categories have different percentage requirements of how much of the costume you had to make yourself and how much skill that percentage is made with thereby offering equity options. So if you want to participate and make everything yourself, which is how I like to compete, you can, and you get your own category. But if you want to participate and all you can afford to do is thrift and modify garments, there's a category for you as well. And you won't just be overshadowed by someone like me who may be equally as good a crafter as you, but just happen to make more. Having categories like these can really reward skill rather than resources the way some contests accidentally do. And I would really love to see how these could be implemented and developed further to make an even more level playing field for all contestants. But uh, even though I totally think you should email your cosplay contest coordinators about this and encourage them to make more equitable choices, I am getting super sidetracked now. <laughs> Out of the tragically few conventions left, <laughs> I found that 28 had definitively no divisions, 9 had skill set based divisions, 55 had skill level based divisions akin to the ICG's system, 26 had age based divisions, and 20 had various other methods of creating divisions. And this is where my mind was actually blown, because when I started this research, I was expecting to find no divisions, skill set divisions, skill level divisions, and miscellaneous random ways of creating and naming divisions. Despite being pretty dang familiar with the cosplay contest sphere, I had no idea age-based systems were so popular. Just did the old day two of filming, because I totally ran myself out of camera battery walk of shame. Where were we? Ah, uh, yes, the pit of despair. Speaking of despair, I don't know if I can do this hair thing. I, my hair is getting too long. We're just gonna, I'm bald now, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't tell me if I look bad. Before I go off about that though, let's look at these results. Because what I'm gonna say has a lot to do with how these numbers can be interpreted. And they can be looked at through a lot of different lenses, especially if you're trying to accurately discern how any given contest works, and make the most educated decisions you can with limited information. If we exclude contests where we have a lack of information, and of course the actual elephant in the room, how many cons don't even have contests, at first glance, you can see that the level systems, like the ICGs, are the most popular. And so, if you want to be prepared, it might be worth it to prepare for entering categories like those. However, at second glance, this information is so much more nuanced. For starters, even though the level system is the most popular, it doesn't actually make up the majority of these system options used in contests. The majority would be sitting right here, at 70 contests. So even though it's the most popular system, it's somehow not what's seen at most contests. And in that respect, is it really worth it to prepare for? As much as I've talked about the ICG in these categories and how important they are for a lot of different contests, would your efforts actually be better spent maybe looking into different categories? Or maybe all of these categories? And the answer is yes and no. Let's argue yes for a second. Depending on the amount of overanalyzing you want to personally do, if you look at the other information available for each type of contest, you're probably going to see some overlap. This can be the size of the contest and size of the convention that it takes place at, how established these events are, the things each value and the actual people who run them, etc. It really depends on which division system and which events you're comparing, but you're probably going to see some patterns. Because I looked at all of these events, <laughs> not just a couple that might be important to certain preparations, and I made a lot of observations. Like, contests with no divisions seem to be a thing at tiny cons or massive ones with very little in between, whereas level systems seem to be most often found at these mid-size average cons. I also saw links and information, like cons run by or affiliated with Read Pop, often have skill set divisions like armor, needlework, and effects, whereas FanX events tend to use the level system of Novice Journeyman and Master, and Anime League events use these totally different categories of handmade, altered, and bought. And these are just a couple observations of my own. There are so many more to be made if you want to put in the work in a way that's good for you in the contest that you're trying to prepare for. But on the flip side, arguing no, 
Let's go back to my findings on age-based divisions because I still can't get over how popular they are. Like I, I had no idea how popular they are. <laughs> but more importantly, this baffled me because I couldn't figure out why. When you look at all the other systems of creating contests, you can often see why they're designed the way they are in the information and rules pages. Often they talk about their values and trying to create divisions that work with them. And that comes from a place of trying to create fairness and equity. And if they don't, you can always look at similar contests and probably gather that they adhere to similar sensibilities. But I didn't really understand the age categories because one, I really only engage in adult-only contests. But two, because they didn't really offer much explanation. That is until I started really digging into it and saw a lot of variations on age-based categories, like Dublin Comic Con's TOTS, Youth Under 16, Adults Over 16, and Pro categories. And then I started seeing more and more kids, teens, and adults categories with a pro tacked on here and there. After looking into this information, I think that age-based systems could be interpreted as skill mastery systems the same way that the ICGS level system is. They are divided up a little different, but I think that the logic behind giving people with less experienced categories and people with more experienced different categories is similar and worth considering when looking at all this info. I like the novice journeyman and master categories a lot because they're based on experience, but are age-based categories, in a way, not doing the exact same thing when you can only have so many literal years of experience in each category? I really like the lenience that the ICG categories give for all ages. Like for example, if you're 40 and you just started learning about cosplay, you can enter a novice. But if you're 20 and you've already been sewing for 10 years, you can enter master. I personally believe that this level system is more equitable than age-based systems, but regardless of my thoughts on equity, I think that they're coming from the same place. And you could actually interpret both of these systems as based on skill mastery. After looking over my sample group, I would also define seven of the miscellaneous systems as based on skill mastery as well. And if you look at the information this way, there is a clear majority that you may wish to prepare for. Out of my sample group, my research has proven that levels akin to the ICG recommendations are the most popular system used to run contests. But you can also sit here and look at my research and interpret it in a more nuanced way to see what might be the most accurate guess at how your contest works if you don't happen to have rules to read that determine your divisions. Basically what I'm saying is, you can do whatever the hell you want with this information. Like, take it and run, be as prepared or unprepared as you want, go live your best life. But as I continue this conversation about preparedness in this video, I will break contests down into two groups, those that have divisions based on skill mastery and those that don't. And when I talk about skill mastery, I will use the ICG's novice journeyman and master divisions to help conceptualize how skill mastery can be divided, both because it's the most popular method and because it's easy to conceptualize and switch some things around and apply to different methods. But please know that you can do whatever the flip you want, like interpret this how you see fit. And please give it up for the research tangent I did for all of you! <laughs> when I could have totally just kept mentioning the ICG guidelines and just never looked in the, into this further ever, because with all due respect, of how long that took! All right, tangent's over. Don't you dare look at how long that took. You knew what you were signing up for when I said the word overanalyzed. But yeah, tangent's over. It's becoming much more common to see the categories of novice journeyman and master at the average cosplay contest, which means that the category disqualification system that I've talked about before on this channel holds up. And you're gonna need to know your place in that to be well-prepared and enter the correct category into any applicable cosplay contest. So, crash course on that. Essentially, it's a common misunderstanding that you have to be qualified to move yourself up to a certain category, when in actuality you can enter any category, even the highest ranked one, provided you aren't disqualified for some reason. Generally, this means that anyone can enter any skill mastery category like novice journeyman or master if they don't have an award or occupational status that disqualifies them from any of these categories. And generally what's being disqualified is novice and journeyman. It is very rare to not be allowed to compete at all, even as a master. In my experience, people really only get banned from competing as master if they are banned from the convention and therefore the cosplay contest within it. Like usually master is just open to everyone. Side note, Anime Boston, why is Master not open to everyone anymore?
my light just died. When signing up for a contest, it's important to choose the category that is the best fit for you, and the category disqualification system can really help with that, but only if you can actually use it. If you don't have anything that disqualifies you from a category, you may have no idea where you actually stand in terms of skill mastery. In my Armor vs. Sewing video, I talked a ton about skill set development, and how only picking categories based on what one can perceive of other competitors on a surface level can be really devastating for contests as a whole. I'm not gonna rehash that whole video here, although totally check it out if it interests you. But I would like to continue from where I left off, specifically at my recommendation of working to educate yourself to be more informed. Of course, my big advice is always gonna be read the rules. If contests have information available, reading the rules will help to keep you as informed as you can be. Even some of the more mediocre rules pages will offer you some information to interpret, as well as contact info to ask coordinators and staff any questions that may arise. And you should totally take advantage of that. Like, reading the rules can get you very far. But we're not here for that, are we? We are here for generalizations! <laughs> I'm going over all this research that I've done because there are certainly contests that have far less than incredibly comprehensive rules pages. Sometimes there just literally isn't any information to go on. And even the information that I've talked about thus far isn't necessarily enough to prepare you for a competition entirely, because there's no actual judging criteria to go off of. Lucky for us, I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> If you're wondering right about now if I'm about to pull another resource and document out of my ass, meaning the annals of the cosplay internet, you'd be right! Introducing the Cosplay Central Crown Championships 2023 multi-page judging rubric. This absolutely unhinged. I'm just kidding, it's a very thoughtful document. I wouldn't be using it as an example if it weren't thoughtful. <laughs> but also, eight pages for one costume contest, isn't that possibly a little too much? Never mind, the ICG guidelines are 32 pages and don't even include an example judging rubric, so at, as you were, crowd <laughs> championships. Anyway, this document is filled with expertly defined judging criteria. And a lot of this info is actually either clarifying information for the rubric that's kind of redundant or specific to this contest. So for the sake of this convo, all we really need to focus on is the rubric on these three pages. While specific cosplay contest judging criteria will not be the same for every contest, and even really similar contests may be weighted entirely differently, a lot of this criteria is becoming more standardized at contests. In the same way that the novice journeyman and master categories are becoming more and more popular to use. For example, this rubric gives the opportunity for each contestant to earn up to 25 points for design or accuracy, up to 5 points for ambition, and up to 70 points for construction. Whereas my big local regional con, Anime Boston, in 2024 is going to divide up their rubric by giving contestants the chance to earn up to 20% of their marks for design accuracy, 20% for technical proficiency, 20% for creativity and problem solving, 20% for attention to detail, and 20% for level of difficulty. Even though one is defined with a thorough rubric and additional information, and one is defined with literally cosplay gods forsaken five lines for you to interpret best you can, when you actually get down to interpreting, you can see there's a ton of overlap in what both of these contests are looking for in their competitors. And after looking at other popular contests where I've been able to find defined criteria, you can see it's not just Anime Boston that overlaps. There really is no set standard, and yet every little piece of the cosplay contest puzzle is developing into something more and more standardized with these increasingly popular methods. But back to this rubric, because this rubric is pretty cool. And it's pretty cool because it's unhinged. And I mean that in the sense that it was created for the Cosplay Central Crown Championships an unhit prestigious series of regional cosplay contests that culminate in one final international contest that crowns a global champion. And because of that, it was created to work with contests around the globe of any size, and with no categories dividing up levels of expertise, which may at a glance seem counterintuitive to trying to figure out what contests want from you and figuring out what category to enter if that is applicable to you, but it's not. It's excellent, and it's excellent for all contests. Please bear with me. So when I say that this rubric works for contests of any size, I mean it. 
I actually spent way too long trying to figure out as many of the attendance counts for the 2022 to 2023 events that hosted the contest that led up to the final contest at Chicago Comic and Entertainment Expo 2023, as I could. And can I just say, brace yourself for these numbers. And by numbers, I mean New York Comic Con. If you don't know shit about New York Comic Con, brace yourself for New York Comic Con. It needs to be stopped, literally, with a much smaller attendance cap. But so, I found out that the size of events ranged from 10,000 attendees at Japan Week in Madrid to 210,000 plus attendees at New York Comic Con. The second largest event that hosts a contest for the crown is Emerald City Comic Con with 98,000 attendees, less than half of what NYCC has. And I'm sorry, you may be in denial about how big New York Comic Con is, because I, well, I certainly am for sure, at least, at least I am. You may be sitting here thinking, well, that sounds pretty big, but it can't be as big as San Diego Comic-Con, the biggest convention in the world. And it's not. It's bigger. San Diego Comic-Con actually lost that title forever ago, and now they claim to be the biggest in terms of cultural impact. So yeah, that's where it's at. Not only is NYCC bigger, but it is well over 30% bigger than SDCC. And for the record, well, NYCC is the biggest con that takes part of this contest. It's actually only one of the biggest cons in the world. If you're wondering why I'm still not over this, even though I'm literally talking myself through convincing myself that it's real, this is Anime Boston, <laughs> a very average middle of the road convention for comparison. I'm getting off topic. I've talked on this channel before about how contest size does in fact matter when picking a contest to compete in. Different size contests will expect different things from contestants and draw in different crowds, especially if they have incentives, which a lot of larger cons do, but smaller cons don't. And I just made some observations earlier in this video about how different size cons might use entirely different systems, which in turn would certainly affect the contest. But this rubric is set up in such a way that no matter the size of the contest it's used at, it works. It's well prepared to be used for competitors who have shown up in virtually anything at all. From costumes safety pinned and duct taped together, to costumes that look like they just walked off the set of Game of Thrones. And this is really important for this series of contests, considering their event attendance, and it impressively caters to it. I stand by what I've said about expecting more from competitors at huge cons and expecting less from competitors at smaller cons. But instead of creating separate rubrics that cater to each the way a lot of individual contests do, the crown caters to every possibility. And when so much of its judging criteria also overlaps with other contests, you can actually use this rubric like a red string conspiracy theorist <laughs> to figure out what other conventions might be looking for in terms of judging criteria, even if they don't list it directly. If you're entering a contest with no skill mastery categories, holy sh that ridiculous contest category research tangent really was relevant all along. <laughs> this rubric is perfect for figuring out general criteria if it's not listed on your rules page already. Like, you don't really need to think much about it because they've listed out options for every type of competitor that could show up to a contest like this. All you, as one of those competitors need to do is read through this and find the criteria you would like to aim to to achieve your personal goals. In the most general sense, that's literally it. Nevertheless, if you do want to think much about it, you can also consider what I've talked about earlier in this video, like the size of the contest and specific system it uses in regards to this rubric. And it's actually really simple to do that. To flesh out this rubric in relation to the not skill mastery system that your contest uses, all you really need to do is one brainstorming session, and then after that you can narrow down what you've brainstormed by looking at contest size. To start this, look at each of the different blocks in the rubric and figure out what they mean for your system. So for example, if your system is a skill set system and you're interested in entering a category like needlework, you would go through this rubric block by block and decide what each means for needlework. So blocks like the costume showcases few different techniques or very basic techniques at a beginner level of mastery, 
could be fleshed out into the costume uses acceptable straight stitching or zigzag stitching on simple fabrics such as broadcloth, is only finished at the hem and has minimal notions, does not make use of understructure, and has no decorative elements. And on the other end of this spectrum, the block that says, the costume showcases a huge number of techniques perfectly. The techniques used to construct the costume are mystifying to a layperson, could be fleshed out into, the costume showcases perfect stitching on lines and around curves on challenging fabrics. Every seam and edge is finished in a way that adds to the structural integrity of the garments. Proper understructures and notions enhance what is already a perfect fit on the wearer. The decorations are executed masterfully and blend seamlessly with all other elements. Well, I can't really do this step entirely for you because I don't know the system or like the little bit of limited information you might be working with. That's really all there is to it. A little bit of brainstorming, maybe a little bit of research, if you happen to be a total beginner in some area related to what you're brainstorming, and then applying this information to the rubric. To narrow this down further so that it reflects contest size, just to really prepare you for exactly what you're looking for, you can either totally generalize and just kind of lop off sections that seem unnecessary, like literally just based on the knowledge that some contests have higher expectations and some have lower ones based on turnout, or you could use information based on previous contests at that con to determine exactly what sections are unnecessary. So for example, if you're attending a very small contest, the very highest ranked parts of the rubric will probably be unnecessary to attempt because the probability of someone achieving something of that skill in a small group is very low. On a general note, this is a safe bet and it would be perfectly fine to make goals based on the information that you have left. But, and I am once again reminding you that I am here to overanalyze. So before you point fingers and pull up the keyboard and uh, ask me why I've decided to fly off my god rocker today, <laughs> consider this. What were you expecting though? One of the big things that you can do to determine exactly how the size of your contest affects how you look at the information on this rubric is analyzing previous contest results. If you have your work and feedback from a previous iteration of this contest to compare to this rubric, whether it be a literal award or some quick critique that the judges gave you, I'd highly recommend sticking to only analyzing that. And I say that like literally for the sake of your mental health. Like, it can be a huge mental strain to analyze the work of others like this, especially if it's not something that you've trained yourself to do. But technically, if you look at any creation from a previous iteration of the contest that you've also gathered some form of feedback for, this would very probably just be a publicly announced award. You can think critically about those creations, estimate where they seem to fall in this rubric, and determine the exact range of blocks that the contest falls into from there. This requires being very aware and very objective of the work that you're analyzing. And once again, I'd really like to recommend sticking to your own work, if at all possible, for the sake of yourself. And you may think I've gone totally off the deep end to even recommend looking at work like this, but it can really give you a good look at the range of skill and competitor turnout that the contest has brought in due to its size. Back when I was considering entering into Anime Boston 2018, I analyzed my Yona costume, which had won first place in the advanced category, which was really effectively the journeyman category, at the 2016 Kineticon Masquerade, to attempt to determine generally what AB might be looking for, and how I wanted to create my own personal goals for whatever costume I happen to make in relation to that. I didn't have this rubric to go on, nor did I have the self-awareness and critiquing skills that I have now, but it was a very similar process to this one, and I think it was rather successful. I didn't have a ton of information to go on, really, just that I knew the techniques that I had used for the costume, and that I had earned myself a little trophy. But with some brainstorming, and trying to place that brainstorming on a theoretical scale similar to this rubric, I was able to make this process work for me. I was able to create personal goals that I was happy with and achieve them. And I genuinely believe that you can be even more prepared and have an even better chance at achieving your goals by using the crowns rubric as a resource in this process. Although bear in mind that both of those contests have skill mastery divisions, and while what I just described was my main process, another piece of that process was also considering those categories when creating my goals. So now let's talk about how you can build on this process even further for contests with divisions like theirs. If you're preparing to enter a contest with skill mastery divisions, I'd recommend taking similar steps 
but essentially in reverse. Everything that I just said about determining the size of the contest or looking at past results to determine contestant turnout and what's expected at the contest still stands. Just do that first. But then instead of examining each block in the rubric individually and fleshing those out as needed, I'd recommend using your brainstorming session to divide up the rubric by skill mastery categories. For the actual ICG categories of novice journeyman and master, this would mean roughly dividing up the rubric into thirds across the board within the limits of the contest size. So going back to how I analyzed my Yona costume when I was attempting to figure out what to do for Anime Boston 2018, by simply knowing that I was at the top of the advanced category, I could give a pretty good guess as to what was expected in each category. As I was looking at moving to a slightly larger con and looking to move into the master category due to the category disqualification system, I was able to make personal goals that I think aligned pretty well with what was expected of the master category at AB. And please note that I say that partly because I literally ended up receiving the best possible prize I could get at AB. If I had applied my knowledge and my brainstorming now to the crowns rubric and divided that into thirds, I know I could have given myself an even clearer look into the categories and given myself more precise personal goals. Because if I literally sit here and relive my process as a little thought experiment and compare it to the observations and theories that I actually made and steps that I took, I know it's better. I know it's more clear. Even though I would of course encourage you to only analyze your work if at all possible, if you're looking to determine what category to enter with no feedback to go on or without having even entered a contest before, you might just have to be a little clever and look at the overall results to determine how to divide up the rubric and pick your category. Or you could of course just generally divide the rubric up kind of on a whim. <laughs> like just go back to the idea of lopping off sections if you don't want to think too much about it like that's cool too but i very much recommend dividing this rubric into category sections in one way or another for skill mastery related contest preparation and determining your own personal goals within that and one little thing to note not related to any of the rubrics or research that i've been talking about just a just a bonus tip Based entirely on my personal experience interacting with and participating in contests throughout the years, I'd also just recommend caring about fit more than you might care about it now. You can absolutely overanalyze fit in relation to these resources, but seriously, even if you have no intention of doing so, fit is so important in cosplay craftsmanship contests. No matter how your contest and division system works, please really think about it when creating your costume. I'm actually asking now, do you think I'm ever gonna finish this video? <laughs> if you've somehow made it this far into this video, I wanna have a real talk with you about one last thing, personal goals. Because throughout this video, I've been talking about how you can use this information to achieve yours. But I mean it when I say real talk, I'm gonna be so real right now. When I say personal goals, I don't mean winning. At the start of this video, I said that I have no idea if you can win a contest. And in this video, I would overanalyze how contests work in the name of preparedness so that you can head into contests with the best chance you've got. But in all seriousness, if you wanna have a good time at a contest and give yourself that chance to do your best and possibly win, just winning cannot be your ultimate personal goal. When you enter a contest, there is nothing wrong with wanting to and hoping to win. I assure you it's perfectly normal. Like side note, now that I've started being more vocal about contests and started to see more opinions surrounding them, it's really starting to weird me out how many people like talk down to others for expressing that hope and, you know, putting their all into their work and trying to achieve it. And to that, I gotta say, let people have their wants. Can we as a community just stop letting others be weird to us like this, please? <laughs> I've never seen this be this weird a problem in other competitive spaces. <laughs> anyway, even if it is a huge hope of yours, which is totally cool if it is, it cannot be your ultimate personal goal because it's not something that you on your own can actually achieve. The hard truth about winning is that the results are mostly out of your control. Whoever wins is determined by not just your work, but all the work of the other people who compete in your contest. 
because whoever wins has presented work that is comparatively the best out of that specific group of people's work. And if you make something that is so out of your control, your main goal, you're more than likely going to end up devastated simply because there are few who win and many who don't. Please don't ever put yourself in that position because the devastation can be crippling if you get to the end of a contest and that's all you're left with. I've talked a bit on this channel about how winning isn't everything and winning actually isn't even equal to success and that there are a lot of other things to succeed in when competing. I've given examples of those other things too and I've talked about how much of a celebration contests are and I really stand by what I've said. But here I want to put that aside and I want to talk about one simple way that you can work out goals that are good for you. In 1981, George T. Duran wrote an article called There's an S-M-A-R-T way to write management's goals and objectives. And while I don't know a ton about him and his work, I do know that the SMART acronym method of goal making and keeping has proven itself and lasted and been passed down enough to make it to me, and sometimes has been evolved into something smarter. While the acronym was initially conceptualized for business goals, it can be applied to many other types of goals as well. All you have to do is remember S for specific, M for measurable, A for assignable, R for realistic, and T for time related. Although to better apply it to more personal goals, this acronym is sometimes modified by replacing the A and R with attainable and relevant, which I think works wonders in this instance where like, we don't need to assign our goals to anyone other than ourselves. And time related is often edited to time bound because I mean, really, it's just better diction. And for the record, the additional ENR that sometimes people tack on to ensure continual growth and success with new goals beyond their initial ones are evaluated and reviewed. If you apply this acronym to creating your own personal cosplay craftsmanship goals, you can create goals that are within your control and you can achieve them if you put your mind to it. So no matter what the other contestants bring to the table, and even if your hopes of winning aren't realized, you can still find success and hopefully joy in what you were able to accomplish. And you can do this with or without the information that I've given today. Although the rubric is a really cool resource and it can really help you with the specifics of this process. It's almost like I care about the wording that the rubric offers in this instance the most by far. Let me give a small scale example. And with the project that I'm working on right now because it's literally the only thing on my mind, wonk. And more specifically, let's focus on just his energy cell. I would like to create the energy cell using cast resin, warbler, and a lovely paint job. I'll measure my success in this project by seeing if I've completed an energy cell by my deadline, and also if other people recognize it as his energy cell. This is an attainable goal because I have mold making and casting skills, as well as thermoplastic skills and all the materials that I need to do this project. It's relevant to me and bigger goals of mine because it's part of a cosplay that I want to complete for a convention that I want to attend. And on a related note, I would like this project done by Anime Boston to fulfill my time-bound portion of this goal. If I were to create this energy cell as part of a competition piece, I would also look at this rubric and literally determine which boxes I would like to check based on my own SMART goals. And I have debated, and I've decided that I'd aim to check these boxes. In determining this and already knowing how this rubric relates to a contest I might enter, I've developed my SMART goals even further, giving me something well-defined and in my control that will really help me work towards creating a piece that I love and finding success and joy regardless of the contest outcome. And through this goal creation and preparedness, I've inherently given myself the best chance I can get at winning because I can't control anything else about the contest. Even looking at all the systems and averages and how everything works, I ultimately have no idea how my work will compare to the work that other people bring. But I can control myself and my work. And if I simply do my best, that is the best chance that I can give myself. And you can do your best and give yourself that chance as well. So, do you now have what it takes to win a cosplay contest? I still don't know. The hard truth about contests like these is that they genuinely come down to how skilled you are and how that skill happens to stack up against the other competitors. Out of everything I talked about in this video, I'd still recommend reading the rules if you have them, <laughs> because none of this is 100% set in stone. Anyway, most of this is literally guidelines or rules that still need to be interpreted in one way or another. And because of all of this, there is no quick formula for winning. 
Not that I'd recommend going all in on winning anyway. All you can really do is the best that you can, and I hope that this video has better prepared you to attempt to do that. Well, I hope you like this video because that is it from me for today. Except it's not, because me writing, filming, editing this at the end of 2023, possibly beginning of 2024, IDK, desperately wants to know one thing of you brave, brave souls who got to the end of this video, and that is, what are your upcoming cost plans? <laughs> Even if it's not pretty much literally the new year for you anymore, it is for me now, so tell me what you're working on. <laughs> tell me your plans. I'm out here losing my mind over Twink, Tears of the Wingedom Link, not to be confused with Twink Twilight Princess Link. What are you losing your minds over? Tell me in the comments and like this video if you think I should seek professional help for my embroidery problem. <laughs> and actually here at the end of all things, well, not the end end of all things, but here at the end of all this video things, <laughs> I got a couple quick things to say. One, yes, I'm aware it's been a while since my last video and I have totally borked my goal of one competition related video a month for 2023. Life had some plans that did not align with my own this time around, but genuinely I intend to make videos whenever I can moving forward so that I can continue to demystify the cosplay competition experience for anyone interested in learning more about it. And I intend to make a lot more cosplay content too. Admittedly, this channel is the first thing off my to-do list when life happens because contradictory to how many ads daddy YouTube puts on my channel. <laughs> it's not actually monetized and I do need to prioritize like a real adult human sometimes. But this channel is really important to me and I'm putting my all into it where I can and I hope you can enjoy. Which brings me to two. Thank you for 2.2k. All right, hold up, hold up, hold up. Stop the presses. Very tired editing dog here. 2.3k. Thank you for 2.3k. It's been really whack trying to bring this channel back to life after I started it like so long ago as a way for me to just scrapbook good times with friends. RIP old con vlog circa 2015 to 2019. And then I tried to make it a little bit more than that. And then it became a deserted hellscape <laughs> post undergrad creative burnout, LMAO. I'm LMAOing on the outside and crying on the inside, don't worry about it. <laughs> but it's been really whack trying to restart this channel and 2.3k means a lot to me. Like, this channel may be important to me regardless, but it's unbelievably cool to me that some of you have stuck around through thick and thin and some of you have joined along the way and now we have this cool growing community and all that. And it's really bonkers to me that somehow this channel has like overnight gone from a little New England niche channel to something that people are commenting on from all over the globe. So here's to all 2.3 flippin' thousand of you. I really hope to make videos for you for a long, long time to come. And a reminder for you to tell me about your cosplays and if I should seek professional help. Anyway, happy 2024!